Good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're here. And uh, I want to congratulate you. You figured out the time change for the people here with us. The people at home probably gave up and just said, I'm going to watch online. So we're glad that you're here with us. It helps to have everyone where they are. And I want to say welcome to our friends uh, that are watching online, too. So we want to welcome you in every way. I, I, if you're here this morning, you can give a wave. Uh, the wave in it has a smile in it, So uh, even though you can't see everything. So we're all good. Thank you for waving back. Uh, we're glad you're here. It is my privilege and honor on this, the Lord's Day, to offer a word of thanksgiving that we can gather. Would you join me, please? Great God, we thank you for today. Today is your day, the day that we give to you this moment. And we pray that as we gather here and we gather online, that we know that your spirit connects us all the way through, all the way around, because your spirit lives inside of us. Transform us this day, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, oh our God. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Oh, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, oh, our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us, and if our God is with us, what could stand against if our God is for us? Then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, oh our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, oh, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, 
then who could ever stop us? Then if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against?
Thank you so much for reminding us of those promises that we have. And this morning, as I lead into prayer, remind you that uh, on our prayer page, we're praying for our friends that are uh, in need of prayer that uh, we are remembering, and also the prayers of those who've uh, texted pray. We're praying for their needs as well, as we are aware we've gotten uh, some feedback from our community. So uh, that is wonderful to know that we can be praying uh, for our friends in the community as well. And to lead into prayer this morning, I want to read from Exodus chapter 34. I'm going to reference this in the message later. And this is the setting. The Lord told Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones. I will write on them the same words that were on the tablet that you smashed. Remember that? Remember there was that moment where Moses came back down the mountain and found them worshiping the golden calf. And these are the words that he gave again to the children of Israel. Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But I do not exercise, excuse the guilty, excuse me, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon the children and grandchildren, and the entire family is affected, even children in their third and fourth generations. I want you to think about that as we come to prayer this morning and as we consider John chapter 9. Would you join me in prayer? Great God, we thank you that you're with us wherever we are. And no doubt, Lord, you are an unfailing God, and we thank you for the promises we have in your word. For they remind us that you're with us, and that we have nothing to fear when we come to you because you hear our prayers and you respond to them. And so, Lord, this morning we offer this prayer uh, to you that we would be forgiven because we are confessing unto you our need for you, a God of mercy and unfailing in every way. So, Lord, forgive us for those places that we have rebelled. Allow us into the place now and invite us into a place where we can hear your words not only of comfort and forgiveness, but those of, of reformation and renewal and transformation. And Lord, as you transform us, we know that you are doing a work. And so we pray that you would work in our world. We pray for the needs of those that are on our prayer list, for the needs that are of those who have offered uh, prayers for us to consider and to continue to offer up those needs for those in our world that need healing, that need your touch, your intervention, your grace, your mercy. Be with the leaders of our world. Give them wisdom and guidance as they make decisions that affect all of us. Be with those who are our partners in mission around the world. We thank you for their faithfulness, and we pray that you would continue to lead them. And we offer the prayer this morning that you taught us to pray, as Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us remember the great hymn because it reminds us of God's foundation, our faith and trust in Christ alone.
Hi, welcome to CC Kids Club Moment. I'm Mary and I'm so glad you're here today. Today I will tell you a short story that I read when I was in elementary school that taught me how to be patient. So there was once a teacher who gave his students some seeds so they could plant and look after them so they can have their own sunflower. One boy in the class who loved sunflower seeds was so excited that he planted the seed and looked after it with great care for many days. When the first shoot finally appeared, the boy filled with impatience went to see his teacher. Can I uproot it yet? He asked anxiously. The teacher answered that he would still have to tend the plant for quite some time before he would be able to collect many seeds from just one sunflower. The boy was disappointed, but he kept on looking after his sunflower. However, he grew increasingly impatient and did little else but pester his teacher about wanting to take out the plant, despite the teacher asking him to be patient. As soon as the boy saw the sunflower's first seed, he cut the plant so he could eat them. But the plant was still green, the seeds were not ripe, and of course, they could not be eaten. The boy was devastated. He had put so much effort into caring for the sunflower. In the end, he had squandered it all for a simple lack of patience. And he was even angrier when he saw how enormous his classmates' sunflowers grew. Ultimately, he resolved not to be so impatient in the future and to listen to his teacher. So, that taught me a lot. So if he had waited a little bit more, you could have a big sunflower and eat a bunch of sunflower seeds. And I want to remind you, when you have to wait, remember what's true. I hope you have an awesome day. See you next time. Easter Sunday, April 4th. We're going to be celebrating in a lot of different ways. 7 a.m. is our first service. It's a sunrise service outside. And then 10 a.m. we're going to be celebrating inside and then also online on a live feed. 11 a.m. you should be inviting all your friends and neighbors to be joining us for the egg hunt. It's for 12 and under and it'll be a fantastic event. Looking forward to seeing you there. Lots of ways to find out all kinds of things that are happening here at our Celtic Cross community. Just text CONNECT 916-967-1414. You want to make a difference and give back to the community while also showing the next generation what a little hard work is like? This will be perfect for you. We'll have fun while we're at it. Family Serve Weekend, April 30th to May 2nd. We're going to be going up to Lake Tahoe and working at Zephyr Point to help them get ready for the next season. It'll be a lot of hard work, but amazing time. We're going to bond and have a lot of fun and teach people how to give back. It is going to be fantastic. Now, it's $37 for kids and $67 for adults until April 5th, so sign up before that. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay $10 more for each. Look forward to seeing you there. Please join us for our Maundy Thursday service, April 1st at 7 p.m. It will be a Zoom service. Watch for more information. One Great Hour of Sharing has made it available for us to make a difference around the world. If you're interested, text SHARING to our church phone number, 916-967-1414, uh, and text SHARING and you'll be able to give towards that great cause.
Speaking of gifts, uh, for those that are here this morning, you may notice that we have two screens up here. Actually, there's three at the sanctuary. You just have to turn around and look, and there's one on the back, too, uh, for the people up here when they're doing their uh, presentation for you. I just want to say uh, we're very, very grateful for the opportunity to be able to, to install these, to pay for them. It, it is through the, uh, the Will and Daphne Horse uh, gift that we were able to do this, to accomplish this. And then I want to thank personally Doug Matchell. If you see him, please give him a thanks. He was here orchestrating this and writing herd on making this all come about. Jeb Nelson and Dean Johnson were in here as well, putting the right uh, you, you don't see any cords or anything, but there is a connection for everything. So know that it's hidden well in our soffits all around the church. And I'm so grateful for it. Uh, soon we'll, we'll be able to, uh, I'll be able to use the screens as well, but uh, we're not quite there yet. I'm an old horse and I'm running hard uphill. So we're going to get there, right? So it's all good. Uh, we, are, we are working towards the goal. And I am so grateful for the opportunity to communicate God's word any way we can in these days, and even on a day where we miss an hour, you're here with me. So thank you for joining, and know that God is with us too. So would you join me as we join our hearts together in prayer? I feel compelled that we need to pray this morning for this message. Lord, I thank you for uh, the word that you provide to us. We have it in written form, but we know that you speak to us. And when we open up our hearts and we understand that your spirit is speaking, we know that there is a tug, there is a communication that goes on that, that gives us the confidence to know that you are alive and well and speaking into our lives. We pray that you would do this now by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this movement to occur. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Again, we are at part four, and uh, when God is with you in the dark. Now, all of us, if we're honest, can tell stories about how uh, we might feel when we're in the dark. Now, I'm not going to have you do that now, but if you're in a group, make sure your leader lets people share the stories of when you were the most afraid. Everybody's got one, and if I were to gather you all up and put you in a group right now, you could share one. Uh, I'm not going to do one now. I'm going to share it in my group. So I'm going to hold it back because I think it's so important that you, you do talk about what it feels like to be in the dark. But I want you to, to imagine the story this morning. And to weave that in is this fellow had been not able to see for all of his life. And yet he was given a gift. And God is with us in the dark. Now, our series is built on this passage here in John chapter 20. At the end of John chapter 20, we, we see these words of uh, John that speak to us in this series because that's that whole idea of what does it mean to believe? These are written. This whole reason that John went back to his gospel, he is the latest of all four gospels, the gospel writers. And he gives us these words. These are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by what? Believing. By actually moving into the action word. My English teachers always wanted to remind me there's action. Look for it. In him will have life and the power by what? His name. The name of Jesus if you didn't notice this morning, I'll just go back and remind you. The music reminds us of the power of God's name, of Jesus' name. And it's because of what Jesus was able to do that helps us understand what belief is. Max Lucado says this in his book, and he has been reminding us throughout uh, the presentations that we're able to see in the groups. Belief happens when we place what? Our confidence in God. Healing occurs to those that need it when they place their confidence in God. Now, I wanted to use a small video. It's only about a minute or so, but it kind of reminds us of what happens when we're in the dark or working our way through a storm. And, you know, this is actually one year today to the day. We actually didn't. This is the one Sunday a year ago today. You may not know this. A year ago today, we didn't have any services. That's that we closed. And I don't think that's ever happened in the history of Celtic Cross. There's always been something happening on Sunday. But 
I want you to think about it this morning as you view this video, just how invincible our God is. Look for the message in the video. Life can bring us storms. Those moments where we wander, wonder, doubt. The journey doesn't stop, but the progress does. It can be lonely, painful. Sometimes we try to stare it down, as if we could somehow will it to go away. Or we think we can go toe to toe and come out the other side, unscathed. We often forget just how small we are. The truth is, storms are inevitable. But when they appear, we have a protector, a savior who knows a thing or two about calming storms. A God who is a stronghold in times of trouble. In our weakness, He is strong. In our fear, He is courage. In our desperation, He is peace. Yes, storms are inevitable. But our God is invincible. Going back to the believe question, our God is invincible. Now, last week we talked about Jesus walking on the water. And we see him walking back to the ship and calling Peter to come to him. And the question is, what happened to Peter in that moment? We know we answered that question to a, a tiny bit, but we continue to ask the question is, what does it mean to believe, and what does it mean to believe every day? Now, the context for this is simply this, that the world, and I like Eugene Peterson's work here in 2 Corinthians. He kind of helps us to see this. The world is blind. They cannot see what we can see if we have come to an understanding of saying, I saw Jesus in that moment. The world is stone blind to the dayspring brightness of the message that shines with Christ, who gives us the best picture of God we'll ever get. In other words, we won't ever see anything like Jesus. Now, and most of us have not had the personal vision of seeing Jesus. I have talked to people, or, and I have uh, heard people talk about their, that experience where they had that. I, I know that exists. I don't deny it. I don't need to, because I believe that it's possible. And I believe it's also possible that God does miracles. He intervenes because it is a fact that someone else's testimony has it happening. So I never get involved in that. It's always funny. People go, well, how do you know? You know because you've had a personal experience. And I've learned long ago that if you've had a personal experience, you have a message to share. Now, the man that's going to be healed in John chapter 9 is, is an interesting story, and I hope this week that uh, if you have a time that you can just carve out, and it will probably take you, I, I think I've done it because I've read it this week. I wanted to time it out. It'll take you three and a half minutes. You read slower. It take four. Four minutes to read John chapter 9, the whole chapter. Because I'm going to go through the whole chapter and lay it out for you this morning. But I won't have time to read it all to you because I don't want to do that to you. I want you just to go back and watch that story of how Jesus heals this blind man. And in this story, we're going to see that there was a situation. And here is laid out, and I'm going to, that's why I read Exodus 34 to you earlier, and remind you that the rabbi, that's what they called him, his disciples asked, why was this man born blind? And that's a kind of a funny question. But I think we believers, we followers of Jesus, often ask this question. Why, why 
are peop- some people born this way? Did they do anything? In fact, the secondary question in verse 2 is, was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? And you might think, well, you know, we don't talk about that today. Yes, we do. We, we, we think that there's a reason that people have issues that they have. I want to say today, we need to let go of all of that thinking. Matthew reminds us that we need not be in that place where we need to judge whether something is happening. Why do we need to do that? I'm going to ask you that question. I'm going to ask you more than once. Why do you need to do that? Do you need to do that? No, because we're really not God. But the rigor question was, I'm going to go back to the Exodus 34 passage just to remind you. And I read it to you earlier just to give you context so you would see it. Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. Again, what was Moses doing when he received this? He had gotten the second copy of the Ten Commandments. The first one got blasted, right? He had to throw it down. He was so frustrated with what had happened, what he had seen. And he said these words were the words that God gives to Moses. I, will, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfilling love to a thousand generations. In other words, I'm going to keep passing this on. And then he says this kind of confusing thing, and I want to work this with you this morning. I forgive inequity, rebellion, and sin. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children, third and fourth generations. And here's what the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all the leaders of the day taught. They had taught the people to believe, and I want to help you see that there is no help in saying there is a reason that a person is born blind. We know today that some people genetically can be born blind. It's possible, right? They can be born. They come out of the mother's womb, and they're blind from birth. And then there's others who will get a disease, and they will lose their sight. You may have known people. I have. You have. Perhaps as well. And that is Nothing to do, and this is a a big conversation. That's why we want to do small groups. Small groups help us because we get to hear the stories of people, and we need to be reminded that there is no reason that God is holding us bound, or it's like what I used to be called the big thumb theory, where God is going to get you because of something you did. Now, there are unintended consequences on choices that we make. I'm not talking about those. We all have made choices in our life we wish we hadn't made, right? Okay, we don't need to share those this morning either. But what well, we have them, but I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about this. What are the sins of the parents or the third or fourth generation? What does that have to do with anything? Well, in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the day were teaching, and they were teaching that. There was a reason that a person was born sin. In other words, they were sinful. That's why they were blind. And Jesus would have no part of that. That's why we see the miracle. Now, the Sadducees, I'm going to jump to verse 9. If you have your Bible open and you were looking at it, you're going, no, well, what happened here? You're jumping along. Yes, I am. I'm going to have you go back and look at it later to get the context. But we know what the situation is. But Jesus is saying, Who healed you? What happened? You see, let the man speak is the question. And he told them. The man called, they called Jesus. And see, the the leaders had called this man in because he had been healed by Jesus. You remember the story. I'll just quickly move through it. Jesus saw this man. He he spit on the ground. Remember, this is the illustration where he spit on the ground. Jesus spit on the ground. And he took the mud and he put it on his eyes. Remember that? And then he said, go down to to the pool of Siloam and enter into that pool. And then you will be able to see. Wash the mud off. And he was able to see. Now, now they're doing the inquisitive part, the, the leaders. And the man, the healed man, said, they call this man Jesus. He made mud and spread it and told me, go to this pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Interesting, isn't it? Emphasis here on now I can see. 
Here's the one thing that no one can mess with if you're having a conversation and they don't really understand this idea of trusting in Jesus. It's this. Now I can see. If God has healed you, if God has met you in a place where you were all alone, whatever it was, and he's done something, who can argue with that fact that God has healed you? You see, we move to that part three of this, and it's this response. Now, I'm going to take you back for a moment to John chapter 1. For some of you, if you have your Bible, you can go and look at that. But you can, you, some of you know that. It's the, uh, the logo statement. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Right? We know. We've heard that being read before. And it's all about light and darkness. Do you know John 1 is emulative of Genesis 1? We go back to Genesis at the very beginning, right? We know about darkness and light. And when light comes into the world, we see this response. And John was very aware of this light. In fact, John 8, 12 is a verse that uh, Jesus just said, I am the light of the world. Remember that? Jesus said that. He talked a lot about light and darkness. And we see this response. And the Pharisees, again, they called the healed man in for the second time because they wanted to make sure they could retrain him back into this idea that it was your sin that got you here. And he's, he's going, I don't know anything about sin. I couldn't see anything. So I don't even know what I was doing. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. You see, he had been healed. He knew who Jesus was. It had nothing to do with, with, with sin or anything else. He just said, I believe. I believe in this man that he can heal. And then he goes on to say, for the second time, they called the man in who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this. And, and you have to remember, too, they're, they're, they're dealing with the fact that Jesus also healed on the Sabbath. This was really upsetting to the spiritual people. You ever notice how the spiritual people, people think they're spiritual? They think they got it all together. I don't want to warn you and me that that's not actually accurate. It isn't, is it? Because, you see, when we open God's Word, it is the light that shines. And here's how he responds. Because they wanted to put this point, because we know this man Jesus is a sinner. You see, they wanted to call Jesus out. The Pharisees were after trying to trick Every which way to say, oh, yeah, well, he's a sinner. But you know, there's one thing that we all know. Jesus wasn't that. Notice the response. I don't know whether he's a sinner. The man replied, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's where we need to be at that point. But he does know this. I was blind, and now I what? <laughs> I see. I was blind, and now I see. If you've been ever blinded in a spiritual context, that's what this whole passage is about. You'll go back and read it this week. If you do, you'll see that the passage is really speaking to spiritual blindness. I, I know I was blind, but now I can see. I don't know whether Jesus was a sinner or not. But, you know, he, he wasn't an expert in the law. He wasn't spiritual in any way. I doubt that he even knew who the Messiah was. I mean, maybe he did, but... It, did it matter? No. He believed in the power of Jesus to heal him. Darkness is a funny thing, isn't it? There's a small open door. But the world is dark, isn't it? When we really get down to it, the world can be very, very large with darkness. But there's just a small door that opens. It's the window of our heart. We like to call it, right? Where the, our heart has this little window. And when we know that God is there opening that door and saying, I want you to go. One of the passages I'm reminded of is Revelation chapter 3. Some of you know it. You memorize it. Jesus said, I stand at the door and what? Knock. And if you open the door, you can go through. Wow. Open doors. Because, see, here's the lesson. 
you can't read this where you are. I apologize to those that uh, probably our friends at home can read this, but uh, you can't. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to even put my glasses on because it's, it's, uh, I, I didn't think it would look this way when it came on the screen. So, you know, best laid, best laid plans, right? Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Our friend Martin Luther King Jr. said that. In the midst of travail, I've been rereading Letters to the Birmingham Jail. I don't know if you uh, know that, that work, but uh, I've been rereading it because for this year I've, I've really been thinking a lot about what, 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 what's going on. And I appreciate the fact that as a, 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 a pastor in the Reformed heritage that we're creedal people. You're probably going, oh, that's, that sounds kind of like a disease. <laughs> it's not. Creeds. We, we have creeds that, confessions. We're a confessional group. We have creeds and confessions for the purpose of, of right-setting us in the time period that we're living in. In the Confession of 67, 1967, there was a confession that the, the heritage of our church, and I began studying this even back in the late 70s when I, when I began taking classes at, uh, in, in seminary. And, it, and they were reminding me of the fact that we need to open our eyes to the challenges of living in the day. Now, this, is, this was written in 67, but the, the words are still real to us in that in the darkness, we, we stay dark, but when we confess our sins and we call out those things, because that's what the Confession of 67 did. It said, I, I, and then go, you can go back and read it online if you want. It was actually very uh, provocative it rocked a lot of worlds. It still rocks mine in that we need to think about what we're seeing now. And as we open our eyes, Jesus said, open your eyes and you will see. Well, darkness kind of keeps me away from seeing. And now I need to open my eyes. And as a, um, and I was telling you, I was reading this, this passage from Birmingham Jail. And it said, moderate white Christians and pastors are those who need to step up. I think I'm in that category. <laughs> I know I'm in that category. And I've been thinking, I need to step up and say, we need to let people know we have a message for this world. I was so proud of our elders when we made a stand with our friends over here at Murph Emanuel Episcopal Congregation. We just stood with them. We just said, this was wrong. Those are wrong things. We need to stand up against those things. And the world is dark, but the lesson is simply this. When Jesus heard all what happened to what they were doing to the man that he healed, he healed this man. And then Jesus went back and said, I heard what happened. He found the man and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? That's common to Jesus. He would ask, do you believe? <laughs> the man then answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. He didn't really know. That's what we're finding out. Whoa. He, what, what, what this is, is this revelation is beginning to happen to him. You've seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord. This is very important. That word Lord is the Greek word kurios, which we translate Lord. He's recognizing him as the Messiah. That's the point here. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Wow. It is such a powerful statement. What are we about? We're about being followers of Jesus. We follow Jesus, and we follow him out of the darkness into the light. And when we do that, we have a statement. We, we believe. You see, that's what believe is, is saying, I trust in the light, the light that will set the world free. C.S. Lewis says in The Weight of Glory, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. In other words, when you begin to see Jesus, what are you seeing? What, 
Do you see transformation? Becky Pipper tells a, a great story about her uh, conversation with, with a, a prominent child psychologist named Robert Coles. Very interesting story. They had this interaction, and he was bemoaning to her that for 15 years he's had a patient come to, her, to him, and he was well-known. And he, he knows, and, and he's a cranky guy, and I, he's, there's been no life change. He does now understand why he is cranky, because as a child psychologist, he's been able to work with him all of his life. But he said, it's my frustration as a psychiatrist and a psychologist that I can't seem to get him to understand all of this, all of this information I've given him. And what it is, he said, he has the information, but he's never experienced transformation. You can know all of the things, but if there's no change inside, <laughs> he goes, it won't help for him to come back and talk about information things. What we need is for transformation to happen. Transformation happens when I see Jesus for who he is because, see, he opens the door for us to see what are God's purposes in this. God's purposes is for us to see that sin is not what God can look at. He can't look at sin. Sin is our failures. And when we give that up, then he takes it away. And what we are looking for is for God and his purpose to take away that. But unless I confess it and say, I've got some foibles I need to put away. I need to look at a little deeper. In fact, Matthew records it this way. He saw it this way and heard Jesus say these words, and he recorded it. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Our eyes and our ears. The question is, is darkness pushing that all out so we can't see and we can't hear? I would say that it's the spirit that healed through Jesus. Jesus heals you and me. Now I see great promises for us today. Trust in the promise. Go back to John chapter 9. Watch the transformation. Look at what Jesus does and ask the man, what do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus can change even you today? tomorrow, perhaps forever. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word moves us. And in this world, we know that there is trouble and travail. We know that we can't fix anything. Only you can. So we give things back to you. We put it into your position. And Lord, if there's things that we need to do, steps that we need to take to be transformative, we pray now that you would do that in ways that we, we want to be faithful. And Lord, we ask that you do this work by the power of your spirit, we pray, all of this in Jesus' name.
Thank you, Stan. You may stand for the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit empower us each and every day to live as his follower in the light now and forevermore. Amen.